Good morning, everyone. The grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with each and every one of you. Thank you so much. You know, like a lot of other people, I'm sure yourselves, many of you, Kim and I have taken a liking to uh, online shopping for Christmas. Any, anybody like doing that? I, it's become my preferred method. It's, it's easy, it's convenient, a lot, a lot less hassle, isn't it? A lot less hassle. Most amazing aspect, I think, uh, speaking as uh, an engineer, is, uh, is the shipping part. Where's Lori Martin? Yeah, you, her husband, she's a widow, to her, well, a widow, but her husband works for FedEx, and he's, that's all he does this season. He ships product. I'm amazed at the efficiency of UPS FedEx. I mean, it's amazing. Uh, just this past week, I'm getting ready to, to go to the office in the morning, and, and Kim was online checking on a package that she had just ordered the morning before. And, and she was just reading the status, and it says, in transit. And just as she read that, the doorbell rang, and it was the UPS man with that package. It, it was almost as if, it, by magic, she pushed a button, and he was there. It, it almost seemed like that. It's, it's an amazing thing. It really is. But as I was studying the text for the sermon this week, preparing things and uh, looking over things, I was struck by the irony of living in a world that expects and demands and, uh, and really thrives on immediacy, the immediate of, of, of life. We, we want things now. We want it all. We want it now. The, the, the way that we want that and, and how that's so different, even, even opposite, if you will, from what the season of Advent is all about. Because if the season of Advent teaches us anything, it teaches us to have the faith to wait, actually. There's, there's a virtue that I think we have lost total conception of in, in 21st century Western culture, and it's, it's the virtue of patience. But I think as we read the, the text this morning, we're going to see that, that God, uh, I think, blesses patience. And in fact, he really roots our faith, our life. He roots our faith life in waiting. And so today we're going to read from, from Luke what it means to have the faith to wait. The faith to wait. So turn with me, if you would, to, to Luke chapter 1. And we'll read the first 25 verses. Very familiar words, often read during this time of the, of the year, Advent. So listen, if you would. Read, if you will. Take to heart, I hope, the Word of God spoken to you today, right here, right now. Luke writes, Many have undertaken to draw upon, up on the account of things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who were from the first, were eyewitnesses and servants of the Word. Therefore, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, it seemed good also to me to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things you have been taught. In the time of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. His wife, Elizabeth, was also a descendant of Aaron. Both of them were upright in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commandments and regulations blamelessly. But they had no children because Elizabeth was barren and they were both well along in years. Once when Zechariah's division was on duty and he was serving as priest before God, he was chosen by Lot, according to the custom of the priesthood, to go into the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And when the time came for the burning of incense, all the assembled worshipers were praying outside. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was startled and was gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you are to give him the name John. He will be a joy and delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord he is never to take wine or other fermented drink. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from birth. Many of the people of Israel will be will he bring back to the Lord, their God, and he will go on before the Lord in spirit and power of Elijah to 
turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Zechariah asked the angel, how can I be sure of this? I'm an old man and my wife is well along in years. The angel answered, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God. And I've been sent to speak to you and to tell you this good news. And now you will be silent and not be able to speak until the day this happens because you did not believe my words, which will come true at their proper time. Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah and wondering why he stayed so long in the temple. When he came out, he could not speak to them. They realized he'd seen a vision in the temple, for he kept making signs to them, but remained unable to speak. When his time of service was completed, he returned home. After this, his wife Elizabeth became pregnant and for five months remained in seclusion. The Lord has done this for me, she said. In these days, he has shown his favor and taken away my disgrace among the people. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And let us pray. Heavenly Father, how good your word is, how true it is, how deep it is. And uh, I pray that today you would uh, allow a deepening to occur here in our hearts and in our minds, in our spirits, in our lives. Lord, would you, uh, would you change us with your word? Would you, would you speak to us and show us and enlighten us and uh, give us an understanding more and more of who you are? Father, forgive me for the mistakes I make. Let them be wiped away from our memories. But everything that's good and true that's in accord with your word. Let all those things remain in our hearts that we might bear fruit for your kingdom. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. It's a long reading. You know, certain authors have certain discernible characteristics in their writing that puts their unique stamp, if you will, on their books. There, there's some books you could read and simply by their style, the style of the books, you could identify the author. For instance, if you were reading a story that's stamped with lots of irony and puns and double entendre and contains soliloquy and it's all in a poetic form, there's a reasonable chance that you might be reading William Shakespeare because that's, his, he sta that's, that's how he's stamped, that's his style. If you happen to be reading a story that is stamped with current day political intrigue, involving, say, a, a CIA agent who uses his uh, superlative in intellectual powers to disrupt foreign uh, schemes against the U.S. government, you, you might guess that you're reading a Tom Clancy novel. That's his style. He, it's the way he stamps it. Well, well, God is also an author. Y yes, he is. Uh, certainly here at Mount Carmel, we say that, that this word that we read is the word of God. Every single adjective, it's all his. He's, he's the author of the Bible. He's the author of life, the author of, of all things. He is an author. And so within his story, God also has a certain discernible style as an author. One of the characteristics you might notice when you read God, as it were, is his frequent use of making people wait for him to come on the scene. They, people have to wait for him to act in their lives. The, the author, God, seems to have a different sense of time than his human characters do in his story. A different sense of time than his human characters expect. Very different. His, uh, his drawing out of time and having his characters wait is one of the most recognizable characteristics, one of his most recognizable stamps that he puts on his stories. Just is. If you, if you read God, you're going to read about waiting. I, I think that his propensity for doing that is a, is a way for asserting his eternal nature. It is. Uh, it demonstrates his authority, his sovereignty over, over time and over circumstances. It establishes the fact that his story will move forward, but it will move forward at his pace and his time and always for his purposes, based upon his will and no one else's. I think that's the, that's the nut, if you will, of, of why waiting happens. 
the, the extraordinarily consistent characteristic of waiting is, is one of the ways, one of the many ways that we know that what we read is authored by, by God. It's, it's so cons- you'll, you'll see it all the time. And, and as, as anyone at Mount Carmel knows, the Bible is, after all, one comprehensive story about Jesus Christ from beginning to end, Genesis to Revelation, and everything in between. We, we know that, right? And so it's no surprise, once again, and I do this all the time because you've got to know this, everything about the Bible was consistent, even, even the waiting part. You know, the, the waiting doesn't just show up in Luke. Waiting began back at the very beginning. Okay, so, so, so it's just one of, those, one of those stamps, one of those marks, one of those characteristics that we know that, that God is the consistent author of the entire Scripture, all of it, every piece of it. Well, this morning in, our, in this chapter of his story, Luke has uh, captured for us two people. Having, they've been, been made to wait for God to act. We, 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 find, we find Zechariah and Elizabeth. And uh, they're apparently getting old. Uh, beyond childbearing years, they've been unable to have children. And we know from reading the story that they had prayed for children. They, they obviously have prayed for it. They, they've wanted children very much so. But that prayer up till now had gone unanswered. Their prayer had been suspended in a time, a season of, of waiting. I'm sure it was very painful for them. It, now, now, it's very reminiscent, isn't it, to the story of Abraham and Sarah, all the way back in Genesis, God, God's story, who also long waited a birth of their own son. They, they had to wait, wait until it was literally impossible, remember, for them to have. They were so old, there was no way physically they could have children. Therefore, it was certainly an act of God. It was, it was the, Isaac was a child of grace. He was a miracle child. He was, it was all God's doing. And he, he, they waited in order to show this was not a human act, but this was an act of, of God. So he was showing himself to be the, the author, the purposer of the story. Also reminiscent of Israel itself. They waited in bondage in Egypt for over 400 years. So, so long that they had forgotten what freedom was like. They, they, could, they couldn't get out of their bonds. Only an act of, as they, only an act of God would get them free. And so it, it was. Reminiscent of of their wanderings in the desert. Forty years they struggled, didn't they? They had had no idea of how to to do this thing, this this promised land thing, but God shows up once again, and they waited, and he gave them victory and the land, and they prospered. It's uh, it's reminiscent about the, the nation going into exile in Babylon. Seventy years they waited. No possible way they could free themselves, but God raised up another army, and he freed them. God's, so there's always been, always this element of, of waiting. You know, the immediacy that, that we want, or Israel wanted, was never quite there. The UPS man didn't show up the next day. He oftentimes waited years and decades and even centuries. Waiting is God's, one of his authorial, as an author, one of his authorial stamps that's consistent throughout all of Scripture. So, so I say that just once again so that, I, I, you know, my desire for you is that you all will understand that this book is nothing less than the inspired Word of God. And every time I get a chance to teach that, I must and I will. So just another, another piece of evidence, I think, that I need to share with you that this is His Word. Amen? Amen. So we see His stamp once more this morning. Zachariah, it was his turn to go into the temple. His, uh, there were, I think the estimate was 18,000 priests or so at that given point. There, was, there were a lot of priests. They, they were in divisions. And uh, only one time in their life were they allowed to go in and serve the Lord this particular way. And, and it fell to Zechariah this particular day. They, they did it by lot, and uh, it was his turn. So it was a, he had waited his whole adult life even to go serve God in this particular way. So you can imagine his excitement. You can imagine... I'm going in, uh, you can imagine your heart pounding. My, my heart pounds on Sunday morning when I come in here. And I, going into the temple of the Lord, can you imagine, boom, 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 boom. Can you imagine, and what happens? And so the, for the first time he goes in, and what happens? But he sees an angel. He wasn't expecting that. You know, so, so you can imagine w- with his, uh, his passion, his heart beating so fast, and, and then God even comes in and, and shows him an angel. He, that's terrifying. It, it's terrifying.
It says, it says that he was gripped with fear. That's, the, uh, that's what happens throughout the Bible when an angel appears. There's people who are gripped. By, when God comes close, you get real meek. You get real humble because you, you start to know your spot. You get to know that I'm human and I'm frail, and this thing is, is more godlike. And when, you, when you're in the presence of God, and let me tell you this. I, you know, I say this sometimes. Sometimes people say to me, you know, Mike, when I die and go to heaven, I've got some questions I'm going to ask God. I've got some things I'm going to tell him. Oh, yeah? No, you won't. Let me tell you what. You get in his presence, you'll be on your knees. You'll be on your face. In the presence of he will not be asking God any questions. You'll be in his presence. You'll be bathing in his light. You, there, you will be quiet. You will be silent, just like Zechariah was made silent. So Zechariah is greeted in this very strange way by, by this angel. And, uh, and, and you can imagine Zechariah saying, well, my goodness, you know, I get to do this once in my life. Where, where did I go wrong? I'm, nothing's going. I come in, and I must have done something wrong. An angel's here. I'm going to be, I'm, I'm going to be, he's going to smoke me. He's going to, he's going to kill me. I, I must, I must have made a mistake somewhere. I'm, I'm in big trouble. You can imagine. The angel says, though, listen to the, listen to the words of the angel, because they're words for us, especially in this season. He, he the angel says, Zechariah, don't be afraid. Don't be those are words for, for anybody, anybody who's been waiting for anything, whatever that, whatever that anything might be, whether it's a relationship or if it's something about an addiction, uh, it's your marriage, uh, it's something about career. Anyone who's ever waited, these, these are words for you. Don't, don't be afraid because the, the angel says, he says, your, your prayers have been heard. Okay, now, now they haven't been answered yet, at least not to the time frame that you wanted, Zachariah, but your prayers have been heard. That's, that's good stuff for the soul, okay? You, you may be waiting for things to happen, for, for, for events to come together in just the right way. You've been praying for it, but it hasn't happened yet. The, the doorbell hasn't rang. The UPS man has been standing out there with your magic box. But God has heard your prayer. There's a lot to be said for that. There's a lot of confidence you can gain from that. Your prayer hasn't gotten lost. It hasn't been misplaced. It isn't, it isn't on the wrong route. It hasn't been routed down to Indiana or something. It's, 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 it's in the place where it needs to be. For Zachariah and Elizabeth, the prayer was for a child. The angel said, you will have a son. And get, and get a load of this, Zachariah. You're going to name him John. You'll have joy and gladness, and many are going to rejoice at his birth. He'll be great before the Lord. He'll be filled with the Holy Spirit even from birth. Even in his mother's womb, he will be filled with the Holy Spirit. How do you like that? And he'll turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will prepare the way for the Lord. Of course, this is John the Baptist that, that we're talking about here, who did make the way ready for Jesus to come and uh, for the kingdom to come. You see, when God shows up, as he did here, when God shows up, strange things happen. Uh, marvelous things happen. Supernatural things beyond nature things happen. Beautiful things happen. Life happens when God shows When the author of life shows up, life happens. This is what happens. When the author of life shows up, he brings life with him who he is. And barren wombs are opened. And we read just a few weeks ago in John's Gospel that even uh, bodies in empty tombs are resurrected when God shows up. People are set free from slavery, from addiction. Demons flee. Sight is given to the blind. The lame walk. The kingdom comes. And it comes now. See, see, God sets in motion his plan of redemption, his plan to rescue all things, and he does it through answering the prayers of people who've been nurtured with the faith to wait. Somehow, in ways I can't possibly imagine or understand, he uses us and cooperates. We cooperate with him. He uses our prayers, and he, he brings them, and he... He even answers prayers like the ones of Elizabeth and Zechariah. And through answering that prayer, he moves his story along. 
his total story of redemption in your prayers as they're answered. God is using all those things in some marvelous, miraculous, mysterious even ways that we can't see to move his story along to its completion, its sure and certain completion. And he blesses us as he writes his story. We're we're invited into the story. We're active participants in the story. And he blesses us in the doing. it's, It's not as if the story is over. It is still being played out. And he's using us. He's using us. Uh, and we're enjoying fellowship with him as his story comes to fruition. Uh, it's the same way he's always worked. It's the way he works. Always doing something new in the same old way. It, that would be, if God were a corporation, that might be his tagline. Always doing something new. something In your life or in your life in the same old way. And there's, and there's nothing, and I, by the same old way, I don't mean that it's, that it's boring. I just mean that he acts consistently always. And he's always doing something new to enact his story, to move it forward. And he does it through blessing your lives. Your prayers have been heard. But, but, but why is waiting so important? That's the big question today. What, what, what's the big deal, God, about making us wait? Uh, why is that so critical? Why, why do you work this, this particular way? Why, why can't I just have it all right now, like a, like a FedEx? Why can't the UPS man come and give me the answers? Why, why can't I just, come on. You can do it, can't you, God? Well, I, I think I understand generally why God works this way. And I, and I hope that you do too, or that you will after this morning. I think it's simply consistent with his nature. It's, it's God being God. He's always true to himself. He can never deny his nature. He's always going to be the same. And his nature, get this, is to do what's good for us. His nature is to do what's best for us because he loves us. Okay, so, so don't forget that. That's an important, he, what he does, he does for our good and our best because he loves us. You see, waiting generates faith. You hear that? Waiting generates faith faith. And having the faith to wait put things, puts things in their proper perspective. It draws us closer to him, which is what's best for us. See, see, if there's no need for faith, there's no need for a relationship with him. And, and God knows because he's our father, that a relationship with him is what's all important. And so he gives us ample opportunity, room he gives us exercise to wait, and in that waiting, to, to garner faith. The faith to wait, so that, not to be frustrated, but so that we can be in relationship with him. Because that's what's good for us. That's what's best for us. That's why he has people wait, to generate faith. Now, now uh, think about the converse of that. Think about the opposite. Let, let's consider life without having to wait at all. Th- think about that. It sounds good at first. It does. And many people strive for that, especially in 2014. Think about everything coming to you on on demand style. You can have anything you want uh, when you want it. Whatever you want, whenever you want it, just snap your fingers, make your little prayer request, and voila, God serves it up. Boom, 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 boom. Here he comes. Think about a life like that. Well, well, first of all, that, that would turn nature upside down. It, it would turn nature cockeyed. It, it, turn, it would turn the tables on truth because that kind of a life would make all of us little gods and it would make God something less. It, it'd be our servant on like a genie that we could rub his, his lamp and he could come out and serve us that way. That's, that's what it would be like if that's what life were like. That we're a bunch of little gods who think they're entitled to anything and everything that we want. No rules. As long as I don't hurt anybody, I can do what I please. No one else's business. And, and don't you dare judge me either, by the way. There's no, no judging allowed in the 21st century. I can live as I want to, right? On demand, when I want it, whatever it is, no rules. Get out of my face. Sounds an awful lot like 21st century America to me. Does it to you? It does to me, by the way. It sounds a lot like it. In 1995, Pope John Paul II, he... Uh, 
he raised the hackles on the backs of the media and on the, uh, the intelligentsia, the progressive thinkers, when, when he said that, that we're living in a culture of death. Culture of death. Abortion on demand. Pornography on demand. Sex without commitment on demand. Death by euthanasia on demand. The sanctity of marriage under attack. The value of family under attack. We demand, we the people have demanded all these things. And we're getting all these things right now and on our own terms. And there's no room for a God in any of that. There's no room for faith to move in any of that. Who needs a God when you can have any everything at your fingertips? No room for faith. That is a culture of death. There's no life without faith. There's no life without God. How can it be so? So, so the desire for immediacy eliminates the whole need for faith. The antithesis of the kingdom of God. We talked about that being in the kingdom zone last week. Well, living without faith, living in a life of total imme- immediacy would be living in the no kingdom zone, the no faith zone, the no life zone. Proverbs says, Paul repeats that there is a way that seems right to a man, but in the end, it leads to death and misery. That's exactly why I think the author, God, has put his stamp of having to wait within and throughout his entire story. Because where there's no faith requirement, there's no God. And where there's no God, there's no life. And I think it is quite that simple, actually. I don't think there's a, I don't think there's a deeper calculus to it. I don't think you need to go to seminary to figure that out. I think it's right there for us to see. It's consistent throughout history. And he does this because he loves us. So he, he guards us. He gives us a guard against the kind of lifestyle that would bring death. He, he, does, he, doesn't, he doesn't want us to live in a, in a life that would bring immediacy, that would bring us, draw us closer away from him. That's not what he wants. See, it, it, like a parent, if you're, if you're a parent, if you're a good parent, you don't give your kids everything they want when they want it. Because all you get is spoiled little brats who are impossible to live with and who are then impossible for anyone to live with. They, that's not, and so God, like the good father he is, gives us that guard against living that way because he doesn't, he doesn't want us to be spoiled little brats. He wants us to have a, a relationship with him. That's life. That's life abundant. So in, in waiting, God exercises his desire for us to grow in faith. And it's by faith that we have life. Therefore, by waiting, by being able to wait, we are being given life. You may never have thought about it that way before, but in, in the waiting is where you experience life. That's waiting is a blessing given by God to lean into him, to experience life at its fullest. We wait, and we have faith, and we have life. So while we wait as disciples of Christ, as we wait for the kingdom to come to its full fruition, as we wait, Jesus has even given us a way to remember, to persevere, to, uh, to celebrate the waiting. He's given us the table, the table of communion, the table of the Lord's Supper, the table where we remember what he's done for us and what he will yet do. Now, this is a remembrance of the promise he made, the promise he kept, the promise he is yet keeping to return again and make everything new again. On that night that Jesus, our Savior, was betrayed, betrayed by a man who was after immediacy, a man who wanted everything now, he wanted kingdom his way right now. He was betrayed by that kind of a man. On that night, our Lord took bread. He broke it. He gave it to his disciples and friends and said, Take this, all of you, and eat it. This is my body, which is broken for you. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup and pouring said, This is the covenant in my blood shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you do in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, 
you do show forth the Lord's death until he comes again. And he is coming again to set all things right. To set all things right. Until then, we wait, not out of frustration, not with sorrow, but with expectation, with joy. We wait with faith, knowing that he will set all things right again and is doing that even now. So come one, come all to the table of the Lord. We practice an open table. You need not be a Presbyterian. You need not be a member of this church. We do ask you parents to guard the table. Help me guard the table by not allowing your child to to take part of anything that they don't understand. This is a sacred meal. and It should not be done so lightly. But come one, come all, as you are, to the table of the Lord and experience the fullness, the wholeness that he brings.